All right, well again, this is part two. Thank you guys again so much for being here. This is gonna be our panel segment where you're gonna hear from alumni of the school, high school admissions experts. I'm gonna go through each of their brief bios so you have an idea of who we're, who we're talking to. I'm gonna ask about 10 to 12 questions and then we'll open it up to the audience to actually be able to answer, um, ask questions direct to the audience, to direct to the panel, or to myself. Now, there's a quick thing. We do have a mic coming around in the audience, so just be mindful of where it is. Right now, we have a force over there. She's gonna be holding our mic, so just kind of keep a lookout for where the mic is so that your voice can be heard, okay? All right, so we're gonna first start off by introducing Shima Joseph. Shima is Brooklyn Tech graduate, class of 96, He's currently a senior relationship manager at Bank of, America Merrill Lynch, Bank of America Merrill Lynch. He brings about 20 years of experience in the finance industry and has an MBA from Chicago Booth, okay? So fancy school, I'm just saying. He's passionate about addressing the diversity issue and building a talent pipeline into the finance industry. So we welcome you, Chief. <laughs> Next we have Carol Brown. She's also a graduate of Stuyvesant. She went to Fordham and Columbia, okay? Um, he's also a mom of two Brooklyn Tech graduates. She's also a co-founding member of the Stuyvesant High School Black Alumni Diversity Initiative. She coordinates alumni outreach at schools and community organizations and has served as a Stuyvesant alumni rep in conversations with political officials. Now, when we first started doing this, we were out there hitting the pavement, reaching out to parents, and Carol was actually one of the folks that we met on the ground at all these events to make sure that parents were armed with the information. So we're super excited to have her with us today. Next, we have Christina Alfonso. She is also a Stuyvesant alum, class of 2001. She currently sits on the board of the directors for Stuyvesant High School Alumni Association since 2012 and serves as the chair of the diversity committee. She's also one of the founding members of Stuy Prep, a program run by Stuy to address the issue of underrepresented students getting into specialized high schools and specifically Stuyvesant High School. So this program gets you ready for the SHSAT as well, okay? She is one of our resident experts on the diversity issue facing black and brown students in New York City. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Next we have Ms. Alyssa Stein. She is the founder of High School 411. It is a high school admissions company that helps parents <coughs> navigate this complex high school admissions process. She's been doing it for quite a few years now. Most, most importantly, she has a, she's a parent of two students currently in the public school system. She has been a PTA co-president. She has served on four executive boards and on three SLTs. Those are your school leadership teams. So this woman is engaged, she's knowledgeable, and she is our resident high school admissions expert. We're so excited to have you. <laughs> we have two more for you. We have Ayo Akinkumi. She is actually a, the admission, a part of the admission squad class of 2017 currently at the High School for Math, Science, and Engineering class of 2021, and she is thriving. She went through our program, and in only a few weeks, really, she was there for about a month and a half, she was able to score high enough to get into H HSMSE, okay? She's gonna provide her unique experience on how she got in. She also got into Columbia Secondary School, which is also in this district, okay? It's most important for me that I had her here on the panel because for this area, District 5 and 6, HSMSC is right in your backyard, and a lot of times we only hear about Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech, but know that you have a specialized high school located very close by to you. It partners with City College, so the children will have access to take college classes. So we're so grateful to have you here today. Yeah. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Ms. Gabrielle Powell. She's been our intern for today, and she also helped us out over the summer. She is currently at Brooklyn Tech. She also worked with us in our program to get ready for the SHSAT. She is currently a thriving student at Tech. One of the, she sits on the board for the Black Student Union, and she is one of the most engaged students I've seen at Brooklyn Tech. So we talked about you can get into the school, but sometimes you don't always know how to be savvy enough to maximize the opportunity. Gabby is doing just that at Brooklyn Tech, so we're excited to have her with us here today. That was a mouthful. But these folks are very accomplished, so I wanted to do everyone justice. So we're gonna jump into the questions. I'm gonna direct questions to one to two of you guys, just in the interest of time, because we wanna leave room for Q&A from the audience, okay? So our first question is, what is so special about getting an offer to a specialized high school? I'm gonna direct that to Alyssa and then Shima. So 
so nice to be here today, and Ty, thank you for organizing this. What an amazing experience and opportunity for families to hear this. Um, the schools that my kids were at were Brooklyn Tech. I have a girl who is now a junior in college, and my son is graduating, so everything you're talking about for the college part is really important, because yes, Jack is going to the school that colleges across the country know about. He's graduating with eight APs and terrific test scores and an opportunity at Brooklyn Tech, you know, as with all these schools, to do things that you don't have an opportunity to do at other places. One thing I'll say is somebody who's working with families through the college process is how wonderful it is to apply to specialized schools and have that other option. You know, the system is getting more and more crowded and there are only so many spots in schools, no matter how wonderful children are, if a school has 150 spots, a school has 150 spots. The specialized schools are this optional thing that you can go and then have an opportunity for this stellar, world-class, free educational experience where they'll have an opportunity to do things they don't do anywhere else. Like I was at parent-teacher conferences last night with, for my son, and he's taking anthropology as a senior. There are only a handful of high schools across the country that teach anthropology. His, his teacher was a professor in college, and she came to Brooklyn Tech to teach kids. They don't have an AP exam for anthropology because there aren't enough classes across the country to, to warrant one. But he's getting to learn college-level information that's expanding his horizon on things he's interested in when he continues on his path. And that's a wonderful thing about these specialized schools. He's learned through going to Brooklyn Tech, where they also have to take engineering as a freshman and a sophomore, that he hates engineering. Um, so he's not going to get to college and then go through two years and realize, like, oh, wait, I don't want to do this. He's not a STEM kid in a STEM school, but they also have this amazing humanities program. And so he's a social science <laughs> research major, and he loves sociology. This is what he wants to do when he goes to college. So to be exposed to this when you're a teenager, to watch a child really thrive in an academic environment and see where they want to go and how that informs the next steps is one of the really specialized things about a specialized high school. Thank you. Yeah, I would echo everything that she said. I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn. I went to a small Caribbean school because my parents were from Trinidad. My school was so small that when the, and this is when I went to junior high school and I was there from K to eight, the teachers would move classes and not the students. So I went to Brooklyn Tech, which had a thousand kids. And when I had to move from class to class for the first two days, I was literally scared out of my mind because I had never done that before. However, the opportunities that it afforded me were tremendous. And uh, the caliber of the students that I was with, the programs that I took, AP American History, I went to college and eventually majored in political science and financial economics. And I would say that my first year at Binghamton, which is a, a state school, it was, it was a breeze because of all, the, all that I had done when I was in high school. And I think that it's really important for parents to have the information about these schools, for kids to be motivated to get into these schools because education is really the way to move out of different neighborhoods and different circumstances. And I would say that when I listen to Ty talk about a lot of the high schools that don't prepare kids for college on a large basis, you realize that where you go to school matters tremendously. Thank you so much. All right, it's November. What should parents be doing right now to help their children get ready for admission into a specialized high school? That's for Carol and Christina. <laughs> Forgot the microphone. Uh, seventh graders should be um, assessing. The parents should be assessing their child, looking at, um, at as as Ty has already said, looking at their past uh, performance and the state tests and and their grades and what the kids are interested in doing ultimately, and um, they should really start investigating the high schools now. And even if they if they have time, at to just sneak over to a high school at two or three o'clock and just watch the kids spill out of those schools and see what, what they're like. Um, also, um, go on to the Inside Schools website, oh, everything the time listed, um, and, and look at the, you know, some schools have a, na a great name, but, but then you find out from the comment section, oh, that program was eliminated, or that program is only limited to this. So for specialized high schools, um, you should uh, start assessing your child now. And if they're not quite there at the forest, they should 
look into um, even getting tutoring outside of school, test prep. Also, um, contact the teachers. Um, tell them that you, you and your child are interested in the specialized high schools. They may go, oh, you, oh I'm not sure that, that your child is going to be comfortable there. Don't, don't listen to them. You have to investigate yourself. The, your teachers only know so much. Um, and the principals, too. <laughs> <laughs> and the principals, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was great. Um, pretty much agree with everything that Carol mentioned and Ty, I know, delved into this earlier. Um, but I guess, you know, when your child is in seventh grade or even sixth grade, um, try to think about what sorts of schools your son or daughter might be interested in. And just remember that the for the eight specialized high schools, admission is based just on the SHSAT. And then for the other schools, the screen schools, they look at things such as the state tests and grades. Some even have interviews and portfolios. So once you sort of have that list, you want to, you want to be monitoring two things. Make sure that your child is still working hard in school and getting the best best grades possible if he or she is going to apply to some screen schools and also those seventh grade test scores are going to matter for the screen schools but for the specialized high schools which is what uh, this is about today um, you know start looking into test preparation programs there's so many resources out there so many free programs and then other programs that are very affordable that will help provide your students with the enrichment that they need and also the um, test taking strategies so um, it's really important at this time of the year to try to plan out for spring and summer because I've seen some families wait until the summer to look into options and then they miss an application deadline for something or maybe they're able to enter a program but the student isn't able to enter in the beginning so that's why it's really important that right now you try to figure out scheduling uh, for the spring and summer and figure out what option would be the best for your student. Um, for the art schools uh, for uh, LaGuardia you should also start um, for the uh, studio art putting a portfolio together um, sorting through what your, your child is, is doing. If they're into dance, to uh, take classes in just a basic form. If they, even if they're freelance, uh, freestyle dancing, um, they should uh, take, uh, uh, take class, actual class, structured classes. Okay, how has attending a specialized high school contributed to your success? That's open. <coughs> I would say, again, um, tremendously. So I, I went to Binghamton, and I'll be honest, I, I always listen to Ty, and I've come to, this is the second event that I've done, and all of the students on this panel were much better students than I was when I was in high school. Um, uh, I had you know, pretty good grades. I, I did well on the SATs, but I applied to you know, Harvard, and I applied to Binghamton, okay. and I went to Binghamton, so clearly I didn't get into Harvard. And, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I know. Well, a, a number of my classmates um, did go to Harvard, and, and they do, you know. But, um, uh, but, but the, the point is that it, it taught me how to study. And even today, I continue to connect with my Brooklyn Tech classmates. And this is some 20 odd years into the future. I was just at an Afro Tech conference in San Francisco, which brings together a lot of the best tech minds in the African-American and Latino community. And I bumped into seven or eight people who went to tech. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is that everywhere you go in the U United States, I can say that I went to Brooklyn Tech, or somebody can say I went to Stuyvesant, or somebody says I went to Bronx Science. And everybody says, oh, yeah, we've heard about that school. And that type of brand name, it, it matters. And the thing about this game is that it's a game of, you know, inches, right? And every little thing helps. Um, yeah, there's so many things that come to mind uh, when asked this question. I think back to when I was in middle school, I went to a small parochial K through, or pre-K through eight school in Queens, and um, the, 
you know, the education I got there was so different than the education that I received at Stuyvesant. And I know that had I gone to one of my local schools, whether it was a local Catholic school or a local public school, I definitely would not have applied to the same caliber of colleges that I had applied to or had the same options um, had I not gone to Stuyvesant. And I think that, you know, the, the friendships that you make there um, at really any of the specialized high schools are people that are going to be in your network forever. There are people that you're going to stay in touch with. And they really constantly motivate you to do the best that you can and to keep pushing yourself all throughout life. Um, and I know that even right now I'm about to make a career change and um, hopefully start medical school. And there are so many moments during the process where, you know, it's easy to want to give up when you're <coughs> studying for the MCAT and, and doing all this extra work. And I just think back to my high school days and it's, you know, well, if I could get through Stuyvesant, I feel like I could get through anything. And that was one thing that always kept me going. And I think that that's something that um, graduates of these schools always remember throughout their life. Really quickly, the parents of Morgan Mahir. Morgan, your child is not feeling well. Hello. So you please, please go get them. I want to make sure they're okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, what distinguishes the High School of Math, Science, and Engineering from City College uh, from other specialized high schools? We oftentimes only hear about Bronx Science, Brooklyn Tech, and Stuyvesant, right? Um, so we have Ayo here who's going to actually give her first-hand experience. She's currently a sophomore at HSMSC, and she's going to help us to understand what unique resources and opportunities HSMSC can offer your child. Um, well, first off, one of the advantages is that Can't we're on a you. First off, one of the advantages is that we're on a college campus, so you have access to libraries, facilities that you wouldn't have access to even at Stuyvesant or Brooklyn Tech. And also, we have programs. Because we're um, a math, engineering, and science school, when you get to the 11th grade, you get to major in one of those, one of those um, subjects. And we have a program for science. It's the Mount Sinai Biomedical Program. And you get to spend half your day at Mount Sinai and shadow doctors and do research on medical, medical um, ideas. And you learn so much and that you wouldn't learn at Stuyvesant and Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tech. Not to say that they are amazing schools, but we definitely should hear more about all the other specialized high schools that have so much to offer to other to kids. And we tend to focus on only those schools, but there are, there are other schools that many kids don't hear about, but they could have definitely gotten into, into if they had focused on them too. And I feel like HSMC was a perfect school for me because Brooklyn Tech and Stuy are so large, and that can be an advantage, but it can also be a detriment because it might be harder to, for people to focus on you and learn more about you. Whereas I have a small community where I know everyone and I can definitely see everyone around me. So, yeah. And yeah, Gavin, do you want to speak to Brooklyn Tech? Mm -hmm. Well, um, as she said, Brooklyn Tech is a very large school. In my grade alone, I have 1,500 kids, so in terms of getting it's one, <laughs> it's a lot. I see some of my friends every three months, that's how big it is. <laughs> but in terms of getting one-on-one -on -one attention, you're not, there are things such as office hours and other places where you can go to get one-on-one -on -one teacher attention after school. And in terms of my school, I really enjoy it. Um, we have something called a major system, where basically once you're in 11th grade, you get to choose a major that you enjoy. And I'm in computer science. And through the computer science major, I get access to internships. Like um, during uh, June, I'm going to be applying to get an internship at um, Con Edison Coding. Um, so different internships like that, that people, Ooh. thank you. <laughs> that, uh, people in college don't even get um, access to, I get access to in 11th grade, you know, at 16 years old. So those are things that Brooklyn Tech can provide for you and your child. Awesome. All right. So, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. It was so good to hear students speak about two different schools, and you both are right. There are eight specialized schools, and they're all remarkably different. So when you take the SHSAT and you talk about specialized schools, they get lumped together, 
but every school has a different focus. Every school has a different neighborhood, a different student body, a different concentration. So it's really important when you look at them, they're all wonderful schools, and some will be better fits for your child than others. So people can get very caught up in going to one of the big three, or if your kid is not a STEM kid, they shouldn't go to a specialized school. That's not true. So really be open-minded about checking out all the schools, because you'll be surprised to find that each one of them is such a gem, but they're very different from each other. And some are gonna be good fits for your kids and some aren't gonna be good fits for your kids. So it's good to know that going in so you can really pinpoint where it is that you wanna focus on. Excellent, thank you. So Mayor de Blasio has proposed to get rid of the SHSAT in an effort to diversify the schools. Will it really happen? Um, and how, most importantly, how will it affect your child's chances of getting in? So, I think Alyssa, can you speak to that? And thank Carol. Um, as, a, as a parent um, of two kids who took the SHSAT, they both came out and when they got their high school letters, they said, I'm so glad I had an opportunity to take a test and get a score and earn a seat and know that it was based on my ability. So speaking to that as a parent, that's a really important thing that I think a lot of kids at specialized schools feel. They earn that seat. When it comes to the other methods of admissions in the city, um, for screen schools, where they're looking at grades and test scores, essays, interviews, there are so many different factors that go into it. It depends on what kind of academics you have in your middle school. It depends on how your kid did on those test days. There are a lot of factors, and it's a lot more opaque. Parents aren't really sure how come this kid got a seat in a school and another kid didn't. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lack of transparency when it comes to that. And so a nice thing about a specialized school, and one thing I think that the city misses a little bit in that, there are eight specialized schools. There are over 400 high schools that kids can go to, and many of them are remarkable, incredible academic places as well. Um, to have this one set of schools that are terrific with a singular admissions experience is great for a lot of kids. Some kids don't have the best high school experience or they don't have the best test scores, but this one test gives them an opportunity for a fresh start and a chance to go to somewhere where they wouldn't necessarily have had a, an opportunity because of the other factors. So I think it's great to maintain the system where there is this one thing because there are all these other options out there as well. Excellent. Okay, so the, the mayor is proposing uh, changes to the admissions process to the specialized high schools. Um, the proposal at the moment is to phase out the uh, SHSAT, the Specialized High School Test, and, and then turn it into a more um, holistic, as they call it, uh, uh, emissions criteria um, formula, but that won't affect um, anyone here. Um, next year, the students will all be taking the SHSAT, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the, what, um, so what is it? Is there a second part of the question? Um, so, you know, what do you think about it? And if it were to happen, so but the big thing is anyone here, this is not going to happen for at least three years. So anyone here with a sixth and seventh grader, you have to get ready for the test, okay? So just get that out of your mind. you got to take the test. I wanted to get that clear. Now, if it were to happen, how would things change? Well, I, well in my opinion, I think what will change is that the would actually expose um, the high school's admissions process, what the admissions committees in each high school are looking for. They'll, you'll actually see that they may be favoring certain middle schools because they know what courses those middle schools are offering. They, they'll know the rigor of those classes. They'll be ranking them. I, um, it, it may be transparent, but I, I'm not sure. They'll be, if they are tra really transparent about ranking these classes, are they honors level? Are they truly honors level? Just have an H next to them because out of that whole entire middle school, that's the highest um, that these kids are getting. So um, it might, it'll become more of a mystery, I think. Thank you so much. I'll just add something quickly. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so I've spoken a lot about this and talked to a lot of families and I have a lot of mixed feelings about what was proposed and I don't think that it's the solution to 
what we want to fix in the city school system. So basically what will happen when the SHSAT is phased out is that eventually the top 7% of students in every middle school across the city will receive an offer to a specialized high school. Which specialized high school? They didn't say. They didn't go into how, if there's still going to be a ranking or if it's going to be random or anything like that. So to me, the biggest disadvantage here is that if you have a high performing child in a school that is say in the top 10% and not in the top 7%, he or she will have no chance at all to go to a specialized high school. And because excellent schools in this city are already so limited, um, you know, to me that that's very unfair. I think that it's really at best a band-aid solution to the city's larger problems. I think that there needs to be a pipeline restored to the specialized high schools and have enriched classes in every middle school. I think there needs to be expanded access to test preparation. And I think, you know, there needs to be increased awareness, which I know that there's already been a lot of efforts by the city and other excellent organizations, but um, to me, having this you know, top 7% of every junior high school is unfair simply because um, you know, when it comes to grades, even grades can be a little bit arbitrary and your child may just miss whatever that cutoff is and then we'll have no shot for any of these schools. Um, so that's why I'm mostly against it. I'm gonna take the contrarian view right now as somebody who went to school in Brownsville with a lot of friends who went to schools that were not very good and frankly, I liken it to a Rubik's Cube. The majority of people in here will never be able to solve a Rubik's Cube. You look at it and it's just incredibly complex. However, a Rubik's Cube is not hard to solve. And given the right tools and understanding the right algorithms, anybody given two months, and, and, and that's not saying anybody because there are gonna be some people who struggle with it anyway, right? But given the right amount of time, just about everybody in this room could learn to solve a Rubik's Cube. And that's how I feel about our kids. And that's why I'm passionate about what Ty is doing. Because what we're saying here is that intelligence is evenly distributed. And giving more children the opportunity to get into the types of settings that are going to allow them to excel, I think that we're going to find a lot of kids solving that Rubik's Cube that people didn't think could. And it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank you. All right, what is it like, this is to going to the students, what is it like to be one of the few black and Latino students at a specialized high school? Um, I'm so excited to answer this question. <laughs> well, um, it is, a, when I first got into tech, it was very difficult. Um, I have been going, my middle school and elementary school were majority white, so I was used to being in a setting where I was one of few um, black girls in a classroom. But at tech, um, <laughs> similar to my middle and elementary school, it was difficult to get used to it. People assume that if you you know, you've been, to, you've been in a space where you're constantly the only one, you're gonna get used to being the only one. But it's always very difficult. That's part of the reason why I joined BSU at my school. It's because it provides me with this space to be around other um, black kids at my school that are academically, you know, performing very well, that have the same push, have the same drive. Um, but we're in a space where I can talk about some of the issues that I go through that some of my Asian and white counterparts may not. But overall, it is a school where your academics, you know, are your primal focus. So nobody's going to look at you um, specifically negative because you are black or because you're the only one in a room. Somebody's going to look at you and say, did you do well, you know, in this class? Did you, can you solve this problem? So it's really a school that although you will be if you are a black um, student, you will most likely be, you know, a small percentage of the school. Um, it's not something that's extremely focused on. Thank you. And I <laughs> um, Going to a school with a small black population was definitely a big change because my middle school, my middle school, I went to Lenox Academy, and it has a very large Caribbean population. It's like no white kids, <laughs> barely, barely Latinos. So when I got there, it was definitely a huge shock. It was kind of difficult to get used to, but it's definitely not a detriment. You just have to work hard and everybody will know that you belong there. It doesn't matter what race you are or anything. 
there are definitely kids who are kind of insensitive and will make some horrible jokes and make you feel uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, like she said, it, all that matters is your grades and the opportunities you get and what you do. So just focus on that and everything will be totally fine. Yes. So what kind of activities are you doing to um, increase diversity um, at Stuyvesant? What kind of things do you do around the year that we should know about so that we can participate in to help increase diversity at Stuyvesant? Sure. Um, that's a great question. So um, the Diversity Committee of the Alumni Association works closely with the Stuyvesant Black Alumni Diversity Initiative, which uh, Carol is one of the founders. And we have several events throughout the year that focus on both outreach and also support for current underrepresented students at Stuyvesant. Um, in terms of outreach, we normally have two open houses per year, one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, due to scheduling, there was not a fall open house this year, but we are hoping to organize one for the spring and start publicizing that soon. Um, and that's usually a great success because we have students and families from pretty much all five boroughs come and hear from panels of alumni and current students and get a tour of the school. Um, we also sometimes organize small group tours for uh, you know smaller groups of students from whether it's charter schools or other schools that are interested in learning more about Stuyvesant. So if your school is interested in that, um, you know, please contact me or I can put you in touch with someone from the alumni office because you know, we think it's really important to not just disseminate information about Stuyvesant, but to really have students and families come to the school and see what the school has to offer and you know, most importantly, uh, talk to current students and talk to alumni. We also run a program called Sty Prep, which is for um, you know, students from underrepresented schools, which this is, uh, this past summer 2018 was the third cohort that we had. We started the first summer partnering with one school in Brownsville, um, IS392, and that program had about 30 students. And the last two years we've expanded to uh, 65 and 75 students and we're hoping to expand even further and have students not only from Brooklyn but we're really hoping to expand to other districts um, in Harlem, the, the Bronx, Upper Manhattan. Um, and you know we'll do that through fundraising and you know outreach and such. But I would say those are the major um, outreach events and we also really like to provide a lot of support for the students at the school so um, anytime they have an event we try to organize um, you know sp alumni speakers to come and meet with students and uh, to speak at the events um, I'm trying to think of any other uh, Activity. This information is on the website, so how, do, how would you find out about these activities? Um, yes, we'll make sure that the, uh, the website is updated, but there is information about Sty Prep on the website. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you can just go to the website, but I'll make sure that we have uh, you know, other information that's more up to date. So. Um, the Black Alumni Diversity Initiative, um, we have a uh, Facebook page. We don't have a website. It's uh, Y Sty, W H Y S T U Y. So that's the Facebook page. That just um, we just um, basically disseminate information about um, this event, um, any mock exams coming up. We also talk about alumni, famous alumni from Stuyvesant. Um, also, um, if you want, we have a, a mailing list. If you want to um, subscribe to that, is um, s h s b a d i at yahoo.com. So it's S-H-S-B-A-D-I at yahoo.com. And we also uh, send out um, information periodically uh, if we hear about scholarships coming up for test prep or any information from Ty or uh, the other um, uh, test prep uh, companies that we uh, are affiliated with. And just one more thing I forgot to mention, um, for students who do go to Stuyvesant, I think this has also started at some of the other specialized schools, there's a mentoring program that's run um, by the school and also with the, um, through the DOE where we partner um, you know, students with alumni mentors and that program has been very successful and that also started I believe in fall of 2017 and this coming fall, uh, I, no, I actually started before that, I started the, the fall of 2016, so this coming year will be the third uh, cohort for that. I actually have a question for the young lady on the panel right here who went to Lennox Academy. And I wanted to ask, did, do you feel that the school prepared you at all for the test, or did you have to take the, um, prep, the, prep, the prep courses to be able to, to um, get to the, the school? Or do you feel that Lennox prepared you in a way that, was, that would be different? Lennox prepared me for the school, but not for the test, I'll okay. be honest. 
Lenox was a great school in terms of being trying to be studi studious and time management. It was very rigorous for me. However, for the test, I had to look elsewhere. And I actually got into the dream program. Dream program starts from sixth grade. I got into the dream program the summer before eighth grade. So, and I wasn't put in intensive. I was just put into the program with the kids who had been there since sixth grade. So I was really behind. And when I got out at the end of the summer, I was like, I'm not going to pass this test. So then my mom reached out to Ty, and luckily I got into the program with like six weeks to go, and did all the studying, did everything, and I got in, luckily. But um, definitely look for, if the school isn't giving providing, you have to look for other options for the kids. Mm -hmm. So was it content? Good. Can you be more specific? What didn't they prepare you for? Was it the content? Was it the time to take the test? What specifically weren't you prepared for? Just like the things on the test aren't necessarily things you'd be learning in eighth grade. Like the verbal, we're not doing logic in class, you know what I mean? So definitely the English comprehension, that's pretty something you do in English, but the, 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 the logic questions, I'm not sure if they still have that on the test, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it wasn't there. And some of the math was like, I would look at it and I would just be like, what is this, you know? I'm not learning this in my eighth grade class, you know? So it definitely was, a step up from everything we were learning. You had to go and you have to work for it and you have to do the classes and read the books to definitely get to that level. They changed the SHSAT three years ago. So they got rid of the logical reasoning section and the scrambled paragraphs that people might have heard about. So that's not on the test anymore. They made the test align more to the common core and for what kids are learning in school. So the ELA portion is more aligned to what they're getting in you know, seventh grade and up to the beginning of eighth grade, but the math is not. So the math content on the test hasn't changed and there's stuff on there that kids have not gotten to when, they get, when they're at that point in eighth grade of, of you know, in October of eighth grade. So that's really specifically when you're talking about content on the test, mm -hmm. you need to focus on the math part. But an important part of this is that the test, when you do a test prep program or do something on the outside, it's a long test. Kids aren't used to sitting for that long. It's a lot of material to, to deal with. So test prep practice makes a, a, an amazing difference when you take a test. The more you practice it, the more comfortable you are with the format, with sitting, with knowing how to, if you don't know an answer, how do you deal with it? How do you note things to go back to? You know, my son was doing practice tests every week on his own because he wanted to do well, but he knew the more familiar he was with the structure of it, it would help. So that part is on the, the kid, but when it comes to math content, that's not taught in school yet, so you need to find that on the outside. Thank you. Other parents? I just want to uh, point out that the difference between 30 years ago and now is that, for instance, uh, Brooklyn Tech uh, 30 years ago was 50% black and Latino, 40% black, I, if, I, if I recall correctly, uh, from my friends who went there. Um, they also, the also the difference is, is that there's been a decrease in the gifted and talented classrooms in District 5 and 6, and in District 13, where I grew up in Fort Greene, the gifted and talented, they called it SP, special progress class, um, that I went to no longer exists in, in that junior high school. The performance of the students in that junior high school now are not as, as, as good as, as it was when I was there. So there, there was a, a big change in that the gifted and talented uh, classes were uh, condensed to the, the seven that you see here, the citywide, and then there were some, that, uh, some districts that continued the program on their own. And now um, there are districts that are trying to bring them back. Um, but it's, you know, you have to look at the models of the schools that are really doing it well now and getting the kids in. And that's how, you, and, and if you don't have, if you're not in the gifting and talent program, you have to get tutoring on the outside or just enrich yourself. Um, like I used to teach myself, even though I was in the gifted and talented uh, class, I, my mother was going to uh, college while I was in middle school and I would sneak and look at her algebra books anyway. So, I mean, it's the curiosity and encouraging your child to, to go beyond whatever they're being exposed to in their current middle school. Um, knows very little about what's about to happen. Um, just <laughs> basically, yeah. And he's in a, we're, he's in an independent school, and you know I want to make sure that we look at all different options, right? And so 
you know, I just told him about the test on Thursday, and he, pretty compliant kid, and he said, sure, Dad, let's go. He missed the basketball practice today, which is a big deal for him. But he, you know, he was like, let's do it. Um, on the way here, so this is going back to the panel. On the way here, he asked, he said to me, you know, Daddy, I've been talking to some of my friends lately, and they say that if you go to a, first he said, what's a specialized school? And I said, you know, I explained to him what it was and the different schools, and then he said, well, what my, I've heard my friends say is that you only learn one thing when you go to these schools. Now, the schools where he, that he goes to, right, it's a school that's very much about social justice and blah, 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 and he learns all different aspects of life. And so he, that's what he's thinking about school. And so when he thinks about these schools, he's thinking it's all going to be academics. So how can you guys help me, you know, demystify this for my child? What are some of the extracurricular activities that occur in, you know, some of the specialized schools that I can kind of tell them about and help them get excited? So uh, I'm wearing a jacket right now because uh, I'm part of the soccer team at Tech. Um, in addition to so in addition to BSU, I'm part of the board of BSU. I'm on the soccer team. I'm in the girls who code club, and I'm in the key club. So there's many different things that you can do in addition to academics. I knew that I like to play sports, and it's something that I enjoyed. And the schools can get very stressful if academics is the only thing that you focus on. It can get very overwhelming. I know there was many times, you know. I was late at night and I was crying. My mom's like, what are you crying for? I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, It's crazy. And she's like, well, you like playing soccer, right? Join the soccer team. And it's a group of girls that you know care about academics, but we're also able to have fun. Um, and our school has a basketball team. If your son's really good, it can help us out, because the basketball team right now is lagging. <laughs> it's, it's not that good. It's lacking. But you know, just there are extracurriculars that you could do. Um, oh, I'm not finished there. The um, college applications do look at what you do beyond what the classroom. They want to see you, your um, extracurriculars. Also, if you are in a, a large school or a school where you don't see your friends because you're, you're interested in chem, chemical, chem, chem, chemistry and they're interested in math or English, you can see them after school in the extracurricular activities. So. Um, I like to say that uh, Stuyvesant made it to the finals, their football team made it to the finals this year in their, in their division, they've done that before. Um, <laughs> the Brooklyn Tech, my children went to Brooklyn Tech, my daughter was not in the step team, but the Lady Dragon step team um, won the Manhattan division um, last month or this month, November, in November. Um, so you can see Stuyvesant says step team. Um, they also have um, great arts because you know they're applying to LaGuardia. These, a lot of these kids, they also have um, artistic backgrounds as well. So the, mu the, music, the music programs at these schools are, are excellent, just as excellent. They, some kids turn down LaGuardia to go to Bronx Science or Sty or, or Brooklyn Tech. Um, and um, so um, you can, so there's 30 PSAL teams at Brooklyn Tech and Stuyvesant. So you'll see everything from tennis to badminton to golf to football, soccer for girls and boys. Um, and also um, for the humanities um, oriented classes, there's um, everything from anime, cartooning to cooking and, and Quidditch. Uh, if, I think, well, they may not, Harry Potter may not be as much in style now, nowadays, but um, when my kids were going, uh, Harry Potter was big, so they had a Quidditch team um, at Brooklyn Tech. Um, also, what other, there were, there's so many, so many different uh, debate team. Okay, Stuyvesant and Tech have competing debate teams. Mayor de Blasio's son was on Tech's um, winning the debate, debate team at the time when he was there. So um, there's um, Model UN. The private schools have Model UN as well. So they'll, they'll probably meet up at, um, and also, of course, there's the robotics teams, and um, um, there's business clubs, there's uh, political clubs. It's it's like, there's so many everything, clubs. Everything, everything. You, you're going to be round. Be. You'll be well rounded at these science high schools mm -hmm. and at American Studies, which is another specialized high school. Yeah. So, everything. We have three parents, so we're going to start with Ms. Laverne, then we're going to go over here, then we're going to go over here. Ms. Laverne, what do you want to say? <laughs> Just real quick, I'm the mother of the triplets, and I want to say, <laughs> and I want to say thank you, Ms. Stott, very much. If it wasn't without her programs, even though my kids were scoring fours, but they weren't learning at that higher level that they should have 
in learning to pass the SHSAT. We go an hour and a half, Saturdays and Sundays, and in the week, they didn't want to be bothered, but yes, I pushed them. Yeah. You have to study with Ms. Dye, and kudos to Ms. Dye. Thank you. So I have a seventh grader, and also to answer, he went to the Bronx Science Open House, mm -hmm. and he loved it. Okay. So now he wants to get there. Okay. And my, my biggest issue right now is the cost of these programs, prep programs, when I looked into them, I wanted to cry. Because yes. I'm a single mother of two, and I don't know how I'm going to get him in. So I don't know if you have any resources that can help you know, other Okay. So reach out to us. We do have some scholarships available. We, there's also the DREAM program. There are other free programs. So just reach out to us, info at admissionsquad.org. We'll connect you with opportunities, OK? For sure. OK, go ahead. First, I want to applaud um, everyone who is successful, especially the young ones here who are giving us all this information. <laughs> However, I want to give us a little bit of light in the, the way you are prepped in school. Cool. How you view your schools, the administration, the policies, whether they are very helpful to the rest of the kids who have not been successful. Because I have this example of my son been doing very well in fourth grade, getting uh, fours. When he went in fifth grade, the first uh, trimester, semester, he got a one mark. He always gets a hundred, nineties, and so forth. He got a lunch. So I had to call the school. I went to the school. I tried to ask about uh, who is teaching my child. Tried to find out the, um, the experience the teacher has. The teacher was the first girl that she, she joined the school as an assistant, teacher's assistant. Then she, teach, she taught first grade. The fifth grade teacher left, and they brought her from first grade to teach fifth grade. I called the teacher, I spoke to the teacher at length. After 10 minutes, I realized the teacher doesn't have experience to teach fifth graders. It's like, oh, it's a short semester. We have to do this, we have to do that. So I called the principal. I reached out to the principal. I went face to face. She told me we are trying our best. So it's like, hey, She's learning on the job at the expense. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So, what's, so just what's your question to the panel? My question is, give us some light what you went through so that we parents can also try to pinpoint the inadequacies in the policies in the school, the teachers, so that we can also confront them to prep our kids. Because I told them that you Subjecting our kids to a teacher learning on the job is going to cost our children not going to specialize high school. Right. Because the kids start getting like a three, but at one point gets a four, and then the next time gets one, a two, that means that there's no proper preparation, no consistency. So it's like a waste of time. We can be doing all this. We okay. can bring them to this program. I've but once the damage is already done, Done. I think Alyssa would be the best for this because she's been extremely engaged as a parent and then Carol, if you had anything else to offer. Um, but there's ways that as parents we can get involved. Go ahead. I'll quickly say be involved with teachers from the beginning. I went to parent-teacher conferences last night. My son said, you don't need to go. I'm a senior. There's nothing you can learn. I said, no, no, no. I want to know who you're with all day. I want to know so that if there is an issue, I have somebody I can go to. Even if you can't go to conferences, reach out by email. I've never had a teacher who, in you know, two kids all these years in public school who didn't respond to me. If you have a problem with a teacher and you can't get it resolved, go up a level. Go to an assistant principal, go to a principal, go to a supervisor, go to your parent coordinator, go to a guidance counselor. If there is an issue, if you see your child struggling in any way, do something about it because the longer that goes, the harder it is to rectify. And once you take that test or once you have that grade on your official transcript, you can't change it. And this stuff really matters. When it comes to public school, in fourth grade, in seventh grade, those test scores, those grades are everything. 
And you can't retroactively go back and say the teacher wasn't good or they weren't trained properly. You have to make sure as you're going through the process, you stay on top of things in real time to give your kid as many opportunities as they deserve to get what they need as they go forward. So really, make phone calls, organize meetings, meet with people to make sure that your child is going on the right path. Yep, excellent. Did you have anything else? Yeah. Um, I know, I think you're talking about middle school, but in the specialized high schools, um, we've also had you know, several conflicts in terms of administration. In my school, the math department, our tests count for 80% of our grade, which basically means if you fail a test, your grade is, you know, is not that good. So um, in BSU, we talked to the math department, we talked to our principal and stuff like that, and he was able to help you know, kind of start the process of reducing that policy. Also in terms of um, like student and teacher interaction, the BSU is responsible for the fact that teachers at Tech now have to go through racial sensitivity training. So they have to know how to interact with their students of color. So it's, um, as well as parents, it's also students. If your child feels like their teacher is doing something wrong, you know, encourage them to advocate for themselves. Like, how do they feel about the administration in their school? Excellent. I'll add to that because I want to say that even though I attended Hunter, I will say to you that my parents have problems with the administration. There was a guidance counselor who said basically I wouldn't get into any college. Okay? So he's sitting with, there with me and telling me this. I'm trying to keep a strong pace as a, as a small child, getting ready to navigate that process. It was my dad, who was probably very similar to you, who showed up in his suit and was like, you're no longer going to be her guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. There was no switching of that. That was a policy. There's no switching. Of, yeah, they switched it for my dad. Mm -hmm. You have to put your foot in it. You have to show up. You can't just make calls. You gotta show up, you gotta put your foot in, you gotta put your, your, your game face on, and be like, this is not gonna happen. The feeder schools that Ty talked about, the, the middle schools that are feeding into like a lot of the specialized high schools, you know, at Hunter Elementary School is once a school too, essentially the teachers that are attracted to those schools to, to go and actually work there as teachers, they have PhDs, you know what I mean? So you're not gonna have that assistant teacher, you know, come up and then teach fifth grade. That's not gonna happen. Because you're not only attracting talented kids, they're attracting, attracting talented faculty. And so all these things matter, but again, the onus is on you. Um, the onus is on you to correct things as quickly as possible. Yeah. Don't just make a call, like take that day off from work and show up and correct it as, soon, as quickly as possible. Getting, getting into these schools is only one step. The whole way through, you've got to fight and fight and fight. You have to make sure that your kid is getting the best out of the experience. Well, another, another thing I just want to mention is always look for resources. The Amsterdam newspaper has a mention about this program in the educational section. My mom always, they didn't always, my parents didn't always have money. They always read the Amsterdam News. They got it every Thursday because it was telling them about different programs. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't as organized as Ty's program 30 years ago, but there were other things to do to supplement your child's education. Getting a four is wonderful. That doesn't mean that you're going to pass that test. It doesn't mean you're going to get a high score on the SH, you know, SH, SAT. That doesn't mean that. You know, you have to prepare for what's in front of you. If it's the test, you have to be prepared for it. Whatever it is in life, if you're going for a civil service exam, you're gonna have to take a test. If you're Joe Haslip, he's gonna have to take the series 63 and series seven. If you're me, you're gonna have to take the bar. If you're that gentleman over there, he's gonna have to take the MCAT and his boards. You're always gonna be tested. As a people, we knew the tests were biased. Yes, they're biased, but you're still gonna have to take them for all of your life. And so you have to make this a priority. Singing and dancing on Saturdays, that is wonderful. Cultural enrichment, wonderful. But you have to focus. You have to make sure that your kid is comfortable, confident, and prepared to sit there on that one day and perform to the best of their ability and knock it out the park. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But I want to go back to something the young lady said. She started talking about soccer. And it, that dovetailed into some of the other programs. And yes, we talk about the weight of academics to get noticed, to stand out. It is important, right? But in fact, in point of fact, many of these schools are looking for well-rounded young people. And so to that end, I just want to say about soccer. I got a soccer player, right? And he was a very good soccer player. No, he wasn't very good academically at the time. But he was so good as a soccer player, West Point committed him to come without even seeing his grades. So I'm saying to you that, yes, 
do this, right? But if your, your young person has an interest, has a talent, has a skill, has something they like or above, nurture that because that can make it stand out. Closing with this. He went to, they got this thing where you go for a few days. That's also competitive, right? You get to do the physical exam and run around with guns and shoot all the stuff to see what it's like to be a West Point cadet. My son gets there and they're doing the classes and he, he calls home. He says, Dad, there are freaking kids here with 4.3, 4.4 GPAs on a 4.0 scale. <laughs> they go into classes, robotics. Somebody said robotics. He said, Dad, they're building, they built a robot in, in 20 minutes. I don't know how to do any of that. Everyone there's an engineer, right? All I'm saying is, every skill and gift your kid has is a potential advantage to make them stand out. But they have to stand on the foundation of academic uh, excellence, and they have to have credentials that cannot be contested. Because if they were prepared to take my kid, and I'm telling you, you some of your kids are, are, are come Lord, right? My kid was oh Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that West Point experience actually flipped the switch for him because now he's a sophomore at the University of Cincinnati. He's a Division I soccer player. He's a starting player. But that's not what I'm most proud of. What I'm most proud of is that that GPA is 3.875. And it has been there. It has been there for three semesters. It has stayed right there. And so the world is, is here. So you don't know what it is that's going to um, ignite it but pursue every opportunity. Heard independent schools, all of that. Yes. Uh, I have a question that I want to first thank you to Ty. Absolutely. <laughs> Obviously, very strong math and science curriculum, and those no are wondering for a child that comes in that is very strong and passionate about math and science, but maybe not as much in the humanities. Will they feel overwhelmed by the curriculum there if you feel like they will have an opportunity to succeed if they don't come in as strong? As strong in, in humanities? In humanities, or as interested or as strong in humanities? Do you, I don't know about that part of their curriculum. I do not believe that they'll be they'll be stressed because. Um, one, I'm also, has, at first I was a humanities kid, but as I got to middle school, I was a STEM kid. So coming into being a STEM kid, and then I started hating humanities, even though I love to read. I always have a book with me, I hate humanities. So I thought I would struggle. But honestly, the way it works in freshman year is that the English, the first semester is grammar. So you're not really doing books, you're just getting back to the basics like little sentences, learning how to write again. And it's actually really helpful in the foundation of writing essays, writing paragraphs, so you build up to that point so you won't feel as stressed. And then in the second semester, you start reading short stories, you start writing little paragraphs, so longer essays. And now, I've, I, re I wrote my first essay this year, and I'm a sophomore. I didn't write an essay till I got, I didn't write a five paragraph essay till I got to September this year. So you're going very slowly, because they know we're not, not all of us are humanities kids. We prefer, most of us prefer STEM, but they still, we're still good at humanities and they make sure that we can do it, no matter what. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's, does that answer your question? Okay, any other questions for the panel? So we're good. Okay. Huh? When do we get the results? Great question. So we're gonna start to wrap it up for you guys. So like, thank you guys so much for being here. <laughs> have any final remarks we're good we're good okay thank you guys so much I appreciate it okay so, so some general housekeeping and then I'll turn it over to you guys um, so the, they took the exam today we're sending it off to the company they will should get it back to us at the latest one week but it should be sooner than that okay so as long as we have your email address on file we can get your child's exam results back you guys saw the cutoff score so it's also going to be you know kind of on in the email you're gonna see what the cutoff score is and what your child has scored and what your next steps need to be, okay? Um, there's a lot of information that you learned today. Please feel free to stay in touch. Also, please feel free to join our mailing list to learn about our future events. We were looking to do this event in all five boroughs 
and more frequently even in, in the District 5 and District 6 area. We also would encourage your support. If you found value, please support us online by donating um, to help us keep, to continue to get, make this happen for the community. Um, and again, if you have an interest in one of our program offerings, go ahead and sign up on our website at admissionsquad.org. We thank you so much for the opportunity to host you today. Okay.